Welcome to the first episode of the Life, Money, and Football podcast, a podcast built to improve all aspects of a professional football player's lives. In this first episode, we profile Tristan Cooper, client advisor and director of the sports and entertainment division at Alex Brown. Tristan was a Division I athlete at Tulane University playing both cornerback and wide receiver. At the end of his time at Tulane, he sort of was at that crossroads of, am I going to be able to play professionally? Do I need to go to another school or do I need to move on with my life and pursue another career? Tristan ultimately decided to move on from football and pursue a new career, although that career being wealth management is still involving football. He comes from a background where his dad has been a coach in and around college football for his entire life and realized that using personal finance and wealth management, he could still be involved in football by serving this unique group of college football coaches that he has a direct relationship and experience with already. I think you'll find this episode really engaging. His story is is unique, exciting, and interesting. So I look forward to you uh, getting to hear all about Tristan Cooper. Enjoy the episode. All right. So today we're here with Tristan Cooper, a good friend of mine and a client advisor with Alex Brown. Uh, he's a former, well, he is still a coach's son. He's a former college football player um, who's, uh, you know, found a different career after playing uh, football in college. So I just want to chat with Tristan today about his life, his journey to where he is today, uh, and hopefully provide some uh, experiences that other college football players uh, can learn from. So Tristan, welcome to the podcast. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Glad to be one of the first guests and, you know, honored to be able to, you know, give back and help you a little bit after all, everything you've done for me. Yeah, so. I was trying to think, <laughs> I couldn't remember if it was 2017 or 2018 that we met. I think that, I think it was, I want to say it was 20, 2018, 2018. I want to say. Yeah, 20, yeah, 28, maybe even 2019, actually. Yeah. I, I, yeah, because yeah. I think it was 18. Because I think I, when I was, yeah. I was still at Carter Financial. So Bill Carter's house is where we met. He's at Texas right. A&M. Yep. Uh, big fan and donor. And, uh, and <laughs> yeah, I think I left Carter Financial a year after we met. Um, and, yep. uh, yeah, so it's been, you know, four or five years uh, that we've known each other. And yeah, I've helped you out a lot, but you've also helped me out too. Uh, and, and some of what we're going to talk about today is, is help me, you know, with what I'm doing now advising NFL players. So I, it's been, you know, it's always great to have conversations with you and now to put one of those conversations out there for others to hear. Um, so I'd love to just start off and, uh, you know, let you go through your journey, you know, starting, as a kid, you know, talking about being a, a coach's son and lo- what life was like. No, absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's very glamorous on the outside, and it, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, absolutely, just getting to be around a bunch of awesome guys uh, and and coaches, families, and things like that. You get to have a crazy experiences going to national championship games, uh, but. You know, there, there's a lot behind the scenes that, you know, gets missed. Uh, there's a lot of moving. I've lived in nine states. Um, most of that is because of my dad's coaching career. Um, also, you know, you get fired. You hear people say things at school and, you know, oh, you know, defense sucks or the team sucks. They need to fire the coach. Uh, that stuff's not so fun yeah. <laughs> to, to deal with and go through. Uh, but you know, throughout all the highs and lows, I, I really think that um, it, it gave me a lot to go on and prepare me for for what I'm doing now. Um, but you know, at the same time, it, it's a it's a crazy life. It's a crazy life. Whenever I tell people about it, they're like, "Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about all of these things behind the scenes." And I'm just like, "Yeah, it's." <laughs> it just comes with the territory. Yeah, and your dad has coached some amazing <laughs> players over his time, and. And, and had amazing success, but it still didn't change that just like so many other coaches, he still uh, had to move. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, uh, I'm sure, you know, it's like being in the military is probably the only thing that's relatable to it. 
Absolutely. That's the, the number one thing when I tell people how much I move. They're like, oh, you're military brat? I'm like, no, <laughs> good kind of, but not not really. Uh, and, and to your point with the moving around, my dad's favorite thing to say is something that Lou Holtz always tell, told him and, you know, is if they can fire me, a Catholic at Notre Dame, then <laughs> anybody is, you know, anybody can can get fired. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's a good one. I don't think I've actually ever heard that yeah. one. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's that's a good one. So, you know, growing up, obviously the moving and, and, and again, being a part of and uh, seeing all the amazing things your dad was involved with. But at what point in your life did you say, like, one, I want to play football, I want to do this? And, and how was he involved in your own playing career? Absolutely. Um, I think it's interesting because my first love was basketball. Um, I, you know, I say that and people think and just like, okay, whatever. But my first level is actually basketball. I, there's video of me, it's like before I could even walk, just throwing a basketball into a hoop for hours, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, and, uh, so basketball was my, you know, my first love. And then, you know, football was shortly behind it. Um, and, you know, just going through, um, youth league and going through, uh, middle school and things like that. Football is a sport that I was better at first. Um, I was always, always a quarterback. Uh, after initially starting playing, I was a quarterback most of my career uh, going through middle school and even into high school. And so, um, you know, with that comes the, you know, you know, a lot of attention and things like that. And so I, I enjoyed that. Um, but in terms of my dad's involvement in it, it's funny because he's very, he was very hands off with me at most of the time, I will say, especially in comparison to my little brother. Uh, and, and his journey, uh, is a little bit different. He, um, you know, was on me about, uh, my weight, you know, making sure that I was eating and cause smaller guy, you know, he's, you know, he's dealing with, you know, SEC guys, Big Ten guys, uh, NFL guys. And he saw, you know, you have to, you know, maintain and be a certain weight. So he was always on me about that uh, constantly throughout the, the journey. But um, and then when I was a quarterback, I used to go and watch film in the meeting rooms and uh, I used to do drills during the summertime and things like that. But he really put a lot of the onus on me to do a lot of those things. And I was I was hungry to, to do that. You know, he would he knew how to stoke the fire a little bit. He would say, you know, you need to learn how to long, you probably need to learn how to long snap because you know, that way you're, you're guaranteed to get a scholarship. And so that, you know, just a little poke here or there to, you know, motivate me and say, like, you know, you may want to, you know, look at things from this. And, I, and it just motivated me more to to want to, you know, be a really good position player, yeah. be a, you know, get scholarship offers and things of that nature. So um, it was interesting. You know, we, you know, people think that it's it's all football all the time. Right. Like we're at home, we're watching the, the game and he's talking about cover two or he's talking about this technique or whatever. And really, um, we sit at home and he sleeps on the couch <laughs> and I watch the game and he wakes up. He's like, what happened? You know? So it's, uh, it's always funny to hear people. They think, they think that it's like that, and it, you know, and in ways that it is, uh, is helpful all the same. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess when you're spending 16 hours a day as a, as a coach, you know, you probably don't want to spend your, your only few hours at home necessarily being all into football. But I think you hear stories, you know, dads sort of being in both camps that are, if they're coaches, uh, you know, all yep. in on their kids or all out. And, like, I don't want to pressure them and want them to figure it out on their own. So, obviously, it sounds like your dad was in that category. But maybe he was in the other category with your brother. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So, he coached me for two weeks – for not even two weeks, one week – in uh in fifth grade and i was like yeah no <laughs> this this isn't gonna work you know he came in and tried to restructure our offense or whatever a little bit and it was good but i was like i just i don't i don't want you coaching me uh and that carried on with my brother he was he was a little he's a little different um there you know and their relationship is a little different as well which kind of contributes to that but He's very hands on, you know, we, we need to be working, you know, hey, he, he very much is, you know, let's go outside and let's work on these things because my little brother, 
know whether he knows it or not at this point. He needs a little <laughs> bit of that oversight. He's he's motivated, but uh, just differently than I am. So uh, he definitely is, you know, hey, let's, you know, we need to watch this film. We need to do these drills and stuff like that. And my brother, you know, my brother wants to be great as well. But just, you know, two different yeah. people. And he, I, I guess he just saw the. He needed two different approaches. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you got to recognize yeah. that in your kids at some point. So, but during high school, absolutely. So during high school, you played in two pretty huge football, high school football states. Is so certainly from a talent perspective. So, talk a little bit about that experience. Yeah. So um, it's funny because you know people don't think of Louisiana a lot of times being such a big football state, but when you look at per capita the guys that are in the NFL from Louisiana, especially Southern Louisiana, is what well, I mean. It, it's crazy to look at just the names and and things like that. And then of course you go to Florida, right? And I mean, you know, you don't have to say yeah. much else, right? So um, it, it's it's interesting because when I you know, I thought the same thing, right? Even being a coach's son and things like that, Florida was all the way, it was always the place that, you know, even when we lived in South Carolina, there, I remember one of my friends, his dad was like, I'm going to move my son to Florida so he'll have better opportunities and all these things, right? Um, and I think my dad's approach has always been, um, and our family's approach is, you, you know, you kind of bloom where you're playing, yeah. right? I think my mom is something, you know, coming from my mom, you know, not being on the football side, that's, that was always her approach. And, you know, if you're good enough, they'll find you, you know, um, great example of that. You know, my, my dad's been so good. Probably one of his best traits is being able to find these talents like, like Tyron or like Robert Mathis who had no offers. And then, you yeah. know, is, it, you know, it, it, so, um, you know, you, if you're good enough, they'll find you. So we we're always taught that, but um, I think the, between Florida and Louisiana, there's so many good guys. It's hard to say, you know, you can, you know, maybe one year there's better talent than another year, but man, it's just so competitive. I think the only difference is, is there's some, there's more people yeah. overall in Florida. And so you have a little bit more from that perspective, but man, some of the guys, I mean, I played on a team with Tim Williams, Nick Brosette, uh, who just recently had his high school touchdown record broken. I mean, he started running back since, Eighth grade for us. Tim played, went on to play at Alabama. Garrett Brumfield, who played at Alabama, or excuse me, played at LSU. I'm not <laughs> for saying that, but uh, but then, but uh, but then you go to Florida, and you know, I think the exposure level, right, is just yeah. different. The media coverage was a little different at that time when I was coming up. You know, the first day of spring practice, Monty Kiffin's yeah. out there, right? And I mean, it's just, that just told me, like, all right, like it's on. Like you have to. You, you got to bring it every day because you never know who's going to be your practice. Like, if Monty Kiffin's going to show up the first day, um, I, I, you know, I played against Vernon Hardgraves, uh, Leon McQuay, um, a bunch of bunch of great players down there as well. So, um, you know, I, I think it, it just, you know, depends on the year. Yeah. But, the, I mean, both places is super, super deep and talented, rich football history. Yeah, conditions. for sure. I mean, you know, going to college at USF in Tampa, and that was sort of – all, most of my friends and roommates that were from the area went to plant. Uh, and, you know, that was sort of the time that, you know, it was just taking off. I mean, it's such a well-known program to your point. I mean, everybody was there. I mean, it seemed like every quarterback was going to go to Alabama at one point in time from plant. Uh, <laughs> and it just, it was, it was unbelievable. So to your point, it's kind of like, like your mom said, uh, you know, you can be anywhere, and if you're good enough, you're going to be found. You can also be one of the places where everybody is looking at you, but get overlooked because there's so many people to look at. And I think in Florida, you know, that, that can happen at times. You know, there's just so many great players out there. Uh, so, you know, I think you, your mom is right. Like, you know, maybe don't always go to the, the place that everybody's looking at. Sometimes you want to be in another place where you can stand out a little bit more. So... Uh, right, right, and it's funny because my I moved my senior my spring of my junior year going into senior year, which is a tough yeah. time, right? Because that's when you're starting to get recruited. That's when you're starting to get looks. Um, I, the only offer I had at the time was Harvard, which people people up here in Boston kill me about yeah. not going, and my mom still I don't think she's forgiving me about it uh, about not going. But um, you know, 
two great programs, right? Like you know, you know, high in Baton Rouge, uh, credits to, you know, coach Chad Mahaffey and, and, uh, and coach Andrew Martin, who Andy Martin, who has continued on with it. Um, you know, I think, and then plant, you know, with coach Wiener, I think that when I came into plant, they were coming off a state championship. Um, you know, I think it was like six or maybe more than that, maybe eight straight years of, you know, 3000 yard passers, um, they've been in six of the, you know, one, four of the last six, eight, eight yep. state championships was the highest classification in Florida. So I think at that time, my dad's point was, you know, Hey, you know, things are getting started at U high. We just had an undefeated season and lost in the court lost a tough game in the quarterfinals, to Calvary. Um, and, and things were getting rolling there, right? Like Dylan Moses was coming along and, he was getting Alabama offers in eighth yeah. grade, you know, and, and, and all that, all those things. Right. But I think his point was, I think we're, you know, I think this place is already established and you have the eyes you'll have, you know, and, you know, having the whole family together was important. My mom had never missed any of my games, uh, you know, to that point really. And he would have an opportunity to come to my games um, being in the NFL now uh, for the first time. So I think that was important to him as well. And, you know, commuting back and forth and things like that. It, it, I think it would have, it would have been yeah. tough, you know, easy to stay there with my friends and part of, you know, it depends on which day you talk to me. Sometimes I wish I would have stayed. Sometimes I'm glad I left, uh, you know, but uh, I think overall it, it worked out, but, you know, two great programs, great coaches um, that both, you know, y- you know, you're choosing, you know, between two yeah. great situations. So I was fortunate to yeah, have Yeah, for that. sure. Well, you mentioned the recruiting process. And yeah, maybe you didn't go to Harvard, but plenty of people would say maybe you went to the Harvard or the, of the South, uh, you know, in some ways. So talk Absolutely. about the, the experience. Because I think in today's world, recruiting is so different from when you were recruited. So hearing your experience, but then also I'd love to hear your perspective on like what you think of NIL, the world that exists today from a recruiting perspective. I mean, we're coming up on times when people are going to start officially signing with, with programs. So, so talk about your experience. Absolutely. Um, it's way different. You know, I would have loved to get, you know, just a little something, you know, like a Canes deal or something <laughs> like that, you know, <laughs> when I was coming up, but, uh, you know, going through the, recruiting process as a player was very interesting because till that point I had only experienced it from being on being on the other side right you're trying to sell these kids on coming to the school and you recruit the whole family right like my dad you know credits them has always been a great recruiter right like it starts in the home you get the little you know the little five-year-old brother what's your name Oh yeah, yeah. I'm gonna be. I'm, you got to offer. You got to offer wherever I am. You got to <laughs> offer. Just you know. So, yeah, I mean, your 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 mom. That's your sister. Like all, you know. So you you see and hear my mom over time. You hear it so much and and see it so much. You start to roll your eyes a little bit. Like oh, here we go. But it's different when you're on the other end of it, right? Because I remember distinct conversation. Um, Coach Rhodes, who was at Iowa State, which is my first um, Power Five offer. Um, I'm on the phone with him and he coached at Pitt and he was with Larry Fitzgerald. And, you know, I thought I had really good ball skills. That was probably my best trait as a, as an athlete. Um, and, you know, I just remember being on the phone with him and he was like, yeah, you know, when I watch your film, man, like you, you got special ball skills that remind me of Larry Fitzgerald. And I was like, wow, like that's so like, yeah. wow. And I got off the phone and I, and I tell my mom who, as you can see, keeps me grounded and she she goes, well, Tristan, remember, like, Larry, remember, like, Larry, Larry Fitzgerald, like, the dude that and I'm like, yeah, you're right. Oh, he, he, he may be trying to get yeah. up a little bit. So, yeah. so you know, it's, it's good to it's good from a perspective of, you know, we know these things, but at times you still have to remember, like, you're being recruited, like they're trying to, you know, this isn't what it's really like. This is this is the best day. Yeah. Right. And so. Um, it's interesting because the social media was, you know, was around, you know, there was the rivals and, um, you know, 24 seven and things of that nature. And I remember having reporters calling me, Hey, you heard, you know, that this coach visited the school today. I heard you met with James Franklin today. I heard you met with such and such today. Like, how did it go? And, um, so it was a little bit different from that perspective, but social media really yeah. hadn't taken off. We were tweeting out our offers and things like that. 
Um, so it was it was in its kind of nuanced nuanced stage. You know, I was, hey, when are you going to announce that you're committing? You know, things yeah. like that. It, reporter, it was mostly reporters reaching out to you in that regard. Whereas now, I mean, the kids have so much um, control and leverage over the situation, um, which is, I think, is great to a certain extent. You know, if you know how to utilize it and properly um, take advantage of it, because you can really control your own recruiting process and, and contacts and things like that. Get your own narrative out there. You don't really have to rely on all these different people and, and things of that nature. Film is so easy to get out now. Um, coaches can watch games live, right? Like I watch, I watch my little brother's game live yeah. tomorrow. You know, so that I mean, that's an amazing uh, thing that 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 you have ability that you have now. Whereas, like when I was coming up, it was a big deal when we played on TV. Like, yeah. <laughs> I was I was super excited. Now there's teams that play on TV every week, yeah. you know, and it's not a big deal to them. So, um, and, and in terms of you know, but in terms of the school part, uh, it was tough because, you know, I think you as you as a competitor, you all and this is, you know, conversations that me and my brother have now is that as a competitor, you think you can or you know that, you know, hey, I matched up against this guy. Like I played, you know, I, I you know, I'm there, you know, five star corner. I played against Brandon Hargraves. I've done, you know, this, that and the other. And, you know, I've competed and won and things like that. And understanding that coaches are looking at certain things that, yeah. you know, they see certain things in other people. And so that was the tough part. You know, I, and I had every Ivy league offer, obviously didn't, didn't want to go that route and didn't go that route. Um, which now I look at, I'm like, maybe should have looked a little bit harder <laughs> at that. But, um, but you know, in my, in your mind at that point in time, as a kid that's come up in it, that's been in all these SEC schools, you think you're going to go to LSU or Alabama or even Ole Miss and, Mississippi State, just just somewhere in yep. the league, right? And so, um, you know, I think you have to realize you, you get the you know the dose of honesty really quick of like, hey, there's only so many spots, and you know there was so many times, hey, if this guy, you know, if this falls through, like, you know, we're we're coming after you, and it just you know that person committed, yep. or you know, hey, you know, calling up last minute, you know, credits to Coach Weiner who. You know, he had a policy like once you commit, like you're committed, you know, and, you know, he had amend, amended that at times in special situations. But, you know, he was, you know, commitment is a commitment. Yep. And I think there there's value to that 100 um, percent. And so I took it really seriously because of that. And and so it, it was, you know, it's interesting in seeing the process, how it's played out now. You have guys, I mean, even back then you had guys flipping and doing all those different things. But that was mostly on the higher right. level, guys. You got guys on a lower level flipping, you know, at, at any time, you know, based on when they're recognized and things like that. Yeah. So it, it's just the whole landscape has changed a lot. Yeah. Cause so. I mean, transfer portal existed, but it, nobody knew it existed because you, it didn't, <laughs> it didn't function anywhere near where it functions like today. Right. So, you know, you, you yeah. making the decision of where you were going to go was a decision most likely for at least three or four years because to transfer, you're going to have to sit out a full year and go through that or go to the you know FCS and work your way that way for a year. But either way, you're going to have to do something for a year that maybe you didn't want to do. So, you, you know, that yep. decision was a big, much bigger decision. And to your point, not in your control as much as, you know, someone like Quinn Ewers. You know, he, he was able to say, you know what, look, I'm going to go take my million dollars and go play at Ohio State because I can't get it in Texas right now. And who knows what the true story is, but he's back at Texas now. So, you know, you could probably do some of the math on that. But uh, but I think you know, he had the, all the control and the whole situation to do pretty much whatever he wanted to do. Absolutely. And I think I think amongst the top, that's always been there, right? Like, I think the top player in my year was Robert Kambichi. And I remember, you know, that was the year that Ole Miss had that great yep. recruiting class with him, Laquan Treadwell, uh, and um, escaping my name, uh, my, my mind right now, but the, the offensive lineman um, that got drafted to the Dolphins. Um, uh, I, I, I want to say little, but he's the right one now. after. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, but, um, but they had, you know, top – Top three players at each of their positions, right? And Kimbichi was highlighted by the one is this one, but um, you know, it was it was more so in terms the control then was like, 
all right, like maybe I can get some of my teammates offered. Like I remember Kim Dietz's brother yeah. was at Ole Miss, right? And part of the recruiting was like, you know, for right or for wrong or, you know, whether they want to say it or not, my brother's here. I want to play with my yeah. brother, right? And so – you have control and leverage in those ways, but not so much in the in the monetary ways, not so much in the movement ways, which I, I think is great. Um, somebody, and I didn't really think about this, but uh, I, think, I think I was reading something in The Athletic and it was talking about how important it is, how it's not so important to, to win the recruiting battle as it is to come second. Because if you have a guy that comes to your place and maybe they don't play as much as they want to, or maybe it's not what they thought it was, then if you finish second, well, when they hit the portal, where are they going to yeah. go, right? So that it's just as important to finish second as it is to to get the kid. So I, I thought that was really interesting. And to your point with, with Quinn's situation, um, obviously is a little different and some other circumstances involved, but, you know, he came back, he was able to come back home, and I think you could comfortably say Texas finished second to Ohio State. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, so that's – you know, it's interesting to see how how the the dynamic and roles have changed, and the opportunities just for athletes have changed. Uh, and I think it's great. You know, I think there there's some regulation that needs to come into play um, for some of this stuff because you can't have the wild west. But I think the freedom of mobility and things like that. I mean, we talked about my dad and coaches move. Yeah. You know, either they're forced or they choose to. Right. You know, we were. You know, Jackie Shaw retired at Mississippi State, you know, three games into the season. And we kind of knew that we were fired, yeah. you know, <laughs> after that. So, you know, but then, you know, you go to LSU and you're coming off a national championship year. And my dad's like, well, maybe I want to jump, make the jump to NFL. And those guys that he recruited, like, you know, he's, you know, he made, he chose, he made his choice. to yep. move. So I think there's, you know, there, there's a balancing act that has to be played. Um, and, and I think we're in very, you know, very young and young in the uh, in the stages of, of figuring out what this thing will actually end up with. Absolutely. Like, so. I mean, you talk to athletic directors, you talk to the student athletes, of course, you talk to the coaches. I mean, depending on which level you talk to, right, in which program you're talking to, you get uh, most of them are we have no clue where this is going to end up. Here's what we're doing today. Right. Some of the big programs, yep. the Alabamas of the world have, you know, staff of three, four, five people solely dedicated to NIL. Well, not every program program can afford that. Uh, so I think most are, yeah, are very, you know, infant stages of figuring out what this means, what it will be in the future. Um, but right now, for anybody who is in high school, definitely should feel that the power is, is, is way far in their hands, you know, and if on top of it, Absolutely. they've been on social media to your point, which really didn't exist even when you were getting recruited. If they've got a brand already that they've built, I mean, there's ways that they can leverage that ability to monetize that to decide which program they really want to go to. Because, you know, what are they going to get that helps them continue to build the brand by being in L.A., right, or – you know, that's why the Big Ten is ser- searching for markets like L.A., right? Why they went and got a program yep. like Rutgers years ago. Even though they're in New Jersey, they're close. Yep. Uh, close, close enough. enough. <laughs> so, so you you know, the whole landscape is definitely changing. It's still trying to be figured out, I think. Uh, but I think what you said is right. Right now, the players have a lot more control than they've ever had. But they're high schoolers. 100%. And not everybody 100%. has a coach for a father. And a, and a great mom, probably <laughs> more importantly by the sound. <laughs> most most yeah. importantly. <laughs> so I think that most that's the, you know, when I think about it is the, the greatest concern, right? Is these, these are 16, 17, maybe 18 year olds when some of these major decisions are really starting to be put in place. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, you know, that was that was how I spun it to myself with the movie. I loved it because you get to start yeah. out, you get to start off new and all that, all these different things. But you're, you talk about your brand. That's what it was for me. I was like, I get this, you know, I get to spread my brand. I get to meet all these people. You know, people wonder why now. Like, I know someone everywhere. Yeah. It seems like because I moved around so much, and those people have moved, and all these different things, right? right. And so that was how you know I 
in a way was spreading my brand. But I, but like you to your point now, I mean, the oh, just the coverage even right and the, the overtimes and all these different opportunities yep. that got my little brother was joking to me actually a month or so ago and he was like, man, he was like you. He's like, if you were a player now, like with some of the stuff that you did, like you would have been on overtime, like, and it would have been, you know, some of the one handed catches and stuff like that. But this stuff just wasn't around. Like I was posting it on my mom was posting it on Facebook, like, look at my yeah. son, like, you know, kind of thing. But, you know, now you make a crazy play. It's on overtime. It's on Max Prep Instagram. Yep. And then, you know, thousands of people across the country who don't even know are liking it. Yep. Right. And so I think that was that you know that was starting when I was coming up, but now you have the opportunity, like you said, to create this huge brand. I think of Nico, the quarterback that's committed to yeah. Tennessee right now, and you know, officially or unofficially, you know, he's the one with the eight yep. million dollar NIL deal. But you know, just the pajama pants that all the kids wear at seven on sevens, right? Like they, I mean, he started that. Off, it was something silly. He, you know, he forgot his you know his shorts or whatever, but. You know, he created a brand off of that. And, you know, and, the you know, you obviously have to – the number one thing I think in all of it that you can't lose is you, you got to play, right? you got to be a good player. you got to make plays and, and, and have that component. And I think that sometimes kids nowadays – and this is the old grumpus man in me coming out, but sometimes they forget yeah. about that, right, is, you know, you got to play. Like, you got to make plays. you gotta you got to be a good player to get this. But at the same time, you know, you can, you have more opportunities to build a brand now more than ever. And that's, and that, and that's so important, yep. um, almost as important as, you know, the actual product on the field that you're putting. Yeah. I mean, there. Michael Strand on the I am athlete episode he was on, I mean, he, he said that he said he knew that as long as he continued to be successful on the field, that whatever he wanted to do after football would be, the possibilities would be greater, the more success he had on the field. But he was like, that didn't mean I didn't dabble and try to learn about different things while I was while I was playing. But I knew the priority number one, I got to be the best player on the field I can possibly be because that's just going to open more doors for me. And I even think Brandon Marshall talks about that on I Am Athlete too. He learned it later in his career and obviously overcoming some of the things that he overcame. But he learned that, hey, I got to put a good product out there in order for these opportunities that I'm getting, because he got them while he was playing, obviously, in order for them to be even bigger than I want them to be uh, today. And so, yeah, I think that it always comes back to go out and play well. Because you look at Quinn, right? You know, highly recruited. You know, he weren't sure what he was going to be because he sat for a year at, at Ohio State. But then he comes out and plays. I think everybody could have seen how well he could have continued to play in that first game against Alabama and now has continued to play since he's come back. So he's putting his mouth where his money is and has been and yep. showing that he's got the skills to back up what people are paying him for his his name, image, and likeness for. So you got to perform on the field, no doubt. Um, and, and hopefully the brand piece doesn't consume too many of those guys who otherwise, if they had grown up when in, in play when you did, wouldn't have really worried about the brand as much as they are today. So you just hope there's there's right. there's very few of those stories that I'm and I'm sure we'll hear about them over the coming years. But you hope there's few of them uh, that come up. Uh, no, absolutely. You know, you always are going to have the guys. I hear guys in the NFL, you know, and ex ex NFL guys, you know. Um, we talk about the I Am Athlete podcast and, um, you know, I listen to Channing Crowder as well. Talk about, he's like, look, I was a guy that I was just trying to collect my paycheck. I didn't really care about, you know, you know, one, if we won, great. If we lost, great. I was going to go to the club. Yeah. Anyway. You know, <laughs> there's those guys. And then there's the guys that, you know, like Tom Brady, you know, may not like him, but he's maniacal in his process in terms of wanting to win and, and be great. Right. And he's not the only one. There's so many guys that are super dedicated, you know, LeBron James of the world, yep. people like that who really are just they're going to do anything on the court and off the court to make sure that they, you know, have the best opportunity to win, you know, within the frameworks of the game. Right. But you're always going to have people that, you know, whatever sport it is, that they just want to collect a check. They just want to be on the team. They just want the association. 
And, you know, there's, you know, in a way, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, as long as you know, like, hey, when it comes time, like, you know, we need, as long as you're doing your job, right. right, at the end of the day, like, that's the, that's the most important thing. And so, um, you know, I think, like you said, with this NIL, with, with NIL and, you know, with all the opportunities that people have, I think, you know, we'll see it. You know, I don't know if we'll see it more. I feel like we, we may just because of, you know, the, the reach that it'll have, you know, more than likely. But, um, you know, I think, you know, just in, it, it, it transforms, right? Things transform over time. Yeah. And I think this is one of those things. Yeah, and I think you already see that performance on the field still matters when it comes to money in the NIL world, right? And because, you know, there's programs that are not performing well on the field that donors have been giving money to, to – you know, build on campus stadiums to indoor practice facilities. But if that team continues to not perform well from the conversations I'm having, you're seeing the money dry up from the donors in the NIL category. Cause they're like, I already gave money to help that on campus stadium get started to, to build that indoor practice facility, you know, to upgrade the locker room, to do this. I already gave that money. And what I see on the field isn't producing a product that I'm happy with. I'm not excited to go to the games. So you want to then you want me to give five thousand dollars, you know, sponsor, you know, give this kid five thousand dollars to come sign autographs at my car dealerships that I own. Well, what value does that have? Like he's not winning. He's not playing well. And so uh, you're you're, right, you're seeing right. that happen. So it gets back to like ultimately, you got to play well. You got to win football games. That's that will bring the money, whether it's to the university, whether it's to the players in NIL, and it'll bring opportunities to get you to the next level. That all of that comes from playing well and winning football games. End of story. Like it's still the same, regardless of the time they changed. Exactly, exactly. And working working in the athletic department and working for the athletic director at Texas A and M during the height of you know, the, the donorship time, you know, I, I don't know what the numbers are now, but at that point in time when I was working there, we were the, the athletic department in the country that brought in the most money more than Texas and Alabama and, Oklahoma, and Ohio State, excuse me. And, you know, they just finished paying off the renovations to Kyle Field while I was there. It's a $385 million renovation. I was doing presentations to donors to endow the, the head coaching position, yep. right, um, for football. And, you know, I think that when all this started, right, it was, you know, okay, well, how, you know, how is this going to affect donations, right? Because you got people that want to donate to the school and, want, you know, because they didn't play. Most of these people that can make these type of donations yeah. didn't play. But then you got the people that really care about the athletic programs, right? And they want to donate to the athletic programs, the facilities and, you know, to make updates because it is an arms race, right? Like, you know, you just you you see Alabama's got, uh, you know, they've got these the desensitization chambers that they have for mental health for athletes, right? And then A and M's gonna come and they're gonna build a whole meditation building, yeah. right? And like, oh well, they've got an academic center standalone just for football. Well, I want one yep. for just football as well. And so it puts on a, a facilities arms race. And now on the NIL side. You see, it's a, so donors are kind of like, whoa, like, where do I put my money, right? Do I put it in this NIL bucket? Do I put it in the facilities bucket um, with a specific, you know, athletic department? I think athletic departments are kind of worried about yep. that, too. Um, and to your point, each school has dealt with it a little differently. You know, Alabama has taken the approach of, you know, hey, we, you know, we want to give our guys that are here opportunities, yep. right? Like this is what Bryce Young has. This is what Will Anderson has. You know, AM is taking the approach with the collective, right? Of, you know, we, we wanna have we wanna be able to give these guys in high school opportunities and then that carries on to when they when they get here. And then you have schools like Oklahoma and uh and I believe Texas Tech as well. It's like, hey, you know, we're gonna give everybody on the team fifty K, here you go. Stuff. Like we're gonna pay them, yeah, fifty K yep. You know, Oklahoma, I want to say it's like 90K or whatever. Everybody on the team is on scholarship. You get it. You're going to have to do community service and all the things that I had to do when I was in college. But you're getting a salary for it, which is, I mean, that's a nice deal, you know, <laughs> for somebody who you may, you may be only a special teams right. player, right? Like you may not be the 12th man. You may not be, 
you know, you may not have the, I mean, I think a Colin Gillespie, like who, when I was at a and you know, who was probably the most popular 12th man ever. I don't know, quote me on that. I'm just, <laughs> it just yeah. seemed like at the time, he even got, I think he was the first 12th man to get drafted, yeah. right? But, um, you know, he, you know, not everybody's him, right? So you got some 12th men that are just the 12th man, right? They just have, you know, and so to have opportunities for, for everybody on the team is great. And so I think, you know, but again, like you said, at the end of the day, you've got to win on the field for, for any of this to matter and for any of it to have have substance yeah. um, and, and be as big as it, as it truly is. Yeah, can. for sure. I mean, you see that even at, you know, a program like a and I mean, there's money will still come from someplace, but there's it, they're going to start to ask a lot more questions if the product isn't there on the field. Because ultimately, I truly feel maybe there's some people, donors, adults, or your motives, but ultimately the reason they're giving to the school is because they care passionately about winning like that if yep. they can't be a coach they can't be a player or they were a player and they can't be on the field anymore and they're just going to do whatever they can do to help them win games yep. i mean and so if that's not happening yep. a lot of questions start to get asked like well what am i giving this for so see so yeah, i think you're still going to see that as the priority uh, so getting back to sort of your time so you end up deciding to go to Tulane. And, and, and you're yep. there, talk about your time when you're there and kind of, I, I think probably every player, like you said, not only thinks they're going to go to the ICC, but then when they even get to college, like, Hey, I'm going pro like that, that, that is my goal, right? <laughs> Which it should be. So talk about kind of your journey while you're there. Um, and, and, and what happened and your thought process around it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, going to Tulane was probably, um, looking back on it was probably the best decision I could have made. Uh, you know, you joked about the Harvard of the South, but that's what they really call it. I mean, and the education uh, that you that you get there, more so the network oh, yeah. that you gain from being there, uh, is is probably the most important thing. You know, being at two schools with great networks, uh, Texas A and M and Tulane. Um, you know, the network that I gained at Tulane was incredible. Um, I did things and met people that I never in my wildest dreams would have thought, I mean, I had a class my senior year where the guy, the, the teacher um, literally just brought in millionaire and two billionaire business owners yeah. to come talk to us in class. Uh, so, you know, just, just that from that aspect of it, it's amazing. You're in New Orleans, um, which my mom, she's going to kill me for saying this, but she cried. She didn't want me to go to Tulane, at least initially. <laughs> so, which is funny. Us living in Baton Rouge so close yeah. by, uh, but when she went, we were there for Super Bowl weekend. She kind of, oh, yeah. you know, obviously got over it a little bit. Um, but I came in, uh, Curtis Johnson is a great coach, a uh, great man. Uh, and, and the staff, you know, I, I committed to Tulane actually two days before signing day. So I was still, you know, weighing my options, figuring things out. And so it became like a thing of like, hey, like what? what's going on? Like, where are you, what are you going to do? And, you know, I went there and after that visit, I, I kind of knew at that point, um, I think, you know, whether part of it was me feeling like a year got taken away from me moving, yeah. you know, with me moving to yeah. Florida or what have you. Um, it just felt like home. And I, I, I you know, I, one of my teammates from U high had already committed. Um, and, you know, he was, he was, he really wanted to go to Houston uh, and he scheduled two lane visit first and then went to and was supposed to go to Houston the next weekend and he committed right after the Tulane visit and didn't even go to Houston. And I was like, Jared, what's like Tulane, really? And he was like, bro, I'm telling you, like they're going into a new conference and, you know, just the momentum around the program, things of that nature. And so I was like, I gotta check this out. And so I went and you know, like I said, fell in love. I had some people come up to me. I won't say any schools, but they came up to me, at, you know, around signing day and before, a little bit before trying to get me to commit and things like that, you know, bigger schools. And I was like, nah, you know, Coach Wiener, credits to him, uh, didn't let me didn't let me change. You know, I would have achieved that goal of going, maybe going to an SEC school, maybe going to, you know, ACC or Big Ten school. And he was like, no, you, you, you made it. He's like, it, normally I would, but. No, I can't. He's like, stick with it. You, you, you really like this yeah. place. And, and CJ was a, is, is a good friend of my dad's. He's, he's helped him out along in his career. Uh, part of part of having your dad in the coaching community is it obviously helps with him, you know, getting you recruited a little bit. It's, I don't think that's any secret yeah. at all. Um, but 
Uh, so that 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 definitely played a part in our role. And, and I was just comfortable with the staff and everything. And so I go there and you talk about um, the aspirations of going to the NFL. You know, you think that like, you know, well, I showed up to, you know, you high and I was a good I man. I've been the best player on the team at the time, but I worked my way up to one of the best players if not the best player on the team. You know, when I was at plant, you know, same thing. I was one of the best players on the team. And so you get to, you know, you don't expect anything less at, at two. Yeah, right? You didn't like, go to LSU. Regardless so regardless of it being in college. Yeah. 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 I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, you know, this is the same thing is yeah. going to happen. You know, I'm going to have a, there's going to be a learning curve. It's going to be a little faster or whatever, but um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get here and then, you know, relatively soon, like I'll, I'll be playing and I couldn't, couldn't have been further from the truth. Um, I don't think I've told many people this is my first workout there. I passed out <laughs> during the summer. <laughs> I passed out. And this is um, moving from Tampa, for the- where it's already hot, to Louisiana, where it's still hot, but it's not Tampa. Well, I, I have to disagree with you on that. I think South Louisiana, specifically New Orleans, is the hottest place on the planet. I mean, i tell you this quick story. We, My senior year at Plant, we came back to play John Curtis, who – Ended up winning the high school national championship that year and is a perennial powerhouse out of New Orleans. Uh, Joe McKnight and a couple other big names went to that school. But we go back and play them in the Superdome in New Orleans, the third game of the second, I think it was the second game of the season, actually. Uh, and all I, my big thing when I was in high school was I always wore long sleeves to practice. Always, all, I don't know why. It just it made me feel like cooler temperature wise. Uh, so I just always wore long sleeves. And so when I got to Florida, I had nothing changed. And I'm like, you're going to die. Like, this Florida heat is different than Louisiana. I was like, I promise you, it's hotter there than it is here. And so fast forward, we play this game in New Orleans. We load up the buses. We're going to our hotels. And they're like, oh, my God, Tristan, you're right. Like, this is this is ridiculous. I, it's never like so all these Florida uh. boys are dying. So anybody anybody that, that says that, you know, that, that Florida is hotter than, than, than New Orleans, I, I bring up that story. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so we uh, so, you know, like I said, I, I passed on my first workout, obviously got acclimated and things like that. And, it, you know, once I was like, OK, you know, again, learning curve, like I'm good. You know, you have those moments where you have a little doubt right throughout your career. When I, you know, I was first playing varsity, I was like, I don't know if I can play with these guys, but over yeah. time you get, you're like, okay, like I, you know, it's an eighth and ninth grader. And then you're like, okay, no, I, I, I can't, I can't. It's just this football. Right. And so I'm expecting the same thing. I'm going through workouts, like things are going smooth. And then we get to fall camp and man, like the second day I was just like blown. I was like, Whoa, like we have, you know, Lorenzo Dawes and who got, drafted in the NFL and, you know, Julius Wormsley, who was an all-conference defensive tackle, and Chris Davenport, who, funny enough, my dad recruited when we were at LSU and transferred to Tulane, uh, talking about the transfer point. Yeah. That was the, the big start of the grad transfer, yep. right? So you see how it's, like, morphed over time. Um, we have all these guys, man, that, like, I was like, whoa, like, uh, uh, Robert, uh, not Robert Griffin, um, excuse me, RG, who was a receiver who was one of the top receivers in the country. And I'm guarding him in practice. And I'm just like, whoa, like this is totally different than any, this is, you know, these guys can really yeah. play. Like maybe we got a little learning curve action. <laughs> and then the third day the pads came on and I was like, yeah, no, nah, I'm, I'm not ready. I got some work to do. <laughs> so, um, you know, and I, that was when I really had my first adversity, honestly, is I, I you know, going through that, and then I got hurt that same third day. Talk about uh, RG. I'm trying to stay off of him and not hit him and show that I can compete. And um, and I get pushed in the back. I fall. My shoulder comes out of place. And um, and that you know that was really the first adversity I had. And they came up to me a week or so later and was like, Hey, like just so you know, like we're gonna research you this year. Um, you know, we want you to you know learn it and all of that. And I was like, whoa, like, okay, you know, you you take everything in stride, right? You're young and you got time and things of that nature. But um, it really was the first dose of medicine, really, that I truly had before. Because, uh, you know, before that, I really could, I was like, okay, like, I can overcome, I can work, you know, I can work my way to, you know, winning a route on, you know, on a top corner or work my way into, you know, covering a top receiver. But, 
I really realized like, no, I got a lot of work to do in a lot of areas. And it was kind of overwhelming. I was like, whoa, like, how do I, <laughs> like, how, how am I, how am I going to yeah. do this? And so, you know, you realize there's a different level of work. There's a different level of, of attention to detail. Um, there's a different level uh, of drive that you really have to have um, when you hit a big wall like that and you haven't really had, yeah. had one like that before. Um, and, it, and it definitely builds some character, uh, you know, going going along the way and along the journey. And, you know, first year we were good. And then the following, the subsequent two years, we yeah. weren't that good. And so <laughs> there, there's another element there um, where you're like, whoa, OK, you know, like maybe... You know, what what am I what what is my part in this? What's my role in this? And you know, our defenses were good, you know, and so in a way we kind of felt like, well, it's our offense's fault. Yeah. Like they can't score points and things like that. And figuring out how to navigate these different situations and dynamics. And then, you know, back to coaching, the, we got a new yep. coach, right? And so how to deal with that, how to man you know, manage those expectations. And then on top of that, I moved from offense to defense. Which I mean, excuse me, yeah. from defense to offense, and so there was another element of of change. And I had surgery and trying to impress this new coach that came in while I'm on a new side of the ball, learning the plays. Which, you know, fortunately, I was able to do. I got named a starter coming out of spring practice at receiver. Um, but as I learned very quickly, like that doesn't mean anything. You got to continue to working. You got to be available. You got to be healthy. And you know, my senior year, I had a ton of or. You know, my senior had a ton of injuries my last year at Tulane and um, inhibited me from being able to, you know, in my belief, be the player that I, that yeah. I was and that I could have been. And so um, that, you know, just when you think you got it all figured out, right? Like now you got this coming in, coming in. And, uh, and then you know, I realized that I, you know, I may want to go somewhere different and, and do something different. And my dad had taken a job at A&M at that point and I began evaluating that yep. aspect of it, right? So there's a lot of a lot of things in a lot of things in play that, that I learned along the journey um, that were that were crucial and just learning how to pivot and um, and, and it was crucial to me learning that hey, like hey you know it's funny because you're coming up in it. My mom always is like you know make your money off the game you know don't make it being in the game whether that be a, a coach or a player, yep. right? Like you gotta you know, your time frame in that is short, right? Like you, like even as a player, you know, if you have a long career, like that's very rare. Yeah. Like, you know, our defensive coordinator, uh, Speedy at Tulane, he played in the NFL for, you know, 13 plus years, right? So very rarely do you have guys that have long right. careers like that, right? And, and that's special. My mom's whole point was like, you know, make if you want to be around the game, do something that, you know, that, uh, that allows you to be around it, but not that heavily involved in it. And so I, I, I kind of took that to heart and, you know, that along with, uh, with, you know, with the, with the moving and things like that, you know, there's co- some of the coaches, kids are girls and some of them are cute. And they say things like, I, you know, I would never marry a coach, yeah. you know, because of all the moving around. So that has a little influence on you too. So, uh, I wanted to be a sports agent. I really went into college thinking like, okay, that's my way to make money off the game. I want to be a sports agent. I'm going to angle that yep. route, whatever I do, um, get ready for law school and be ready to go. And I realized I don't like case briefs. And I was like, law school is not going to be it. For yeah, because you were at, I mean, you're at, you were already at one of arguably the best programs for that. Right. And so, now you're playing Absolutely. football there, but you're there. Like, so, you know, transitioning to that uh, law school and, and heading that route was totally feasible for you if you wanted to. Absolutely. And that truly, I, I watched Jerry Maguire a million times that show me the money. I was, I was fully prepared and, you know, I, all it took was one case brief and I was like, you know, law school is, is, that's not it. That's not the move. That's not it. Um, and oddly enough, I know we'll get into it later, but that's where I learned about financial planning, financial management, financial advising as well, uh, from, uh, Dickie, Dickie, uh, Dickie, oh my God, Dickie Lyons, who played receiver at Kentucky, uh, while we were actually at South Carolina. And so being able to see him, uh, 
go into his second career and do that. That was the first time I really ever heard of financial yeah. advising, um, to be quite honest. And um, I didn't know I was in business school. I'd taken some finance classes, but I wasn't a finance bro by any means. I didn't know what from what, you know, EBITDA, what I don't even have. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> where you're talking about you now I took, you know, two lanes of great education and I got I was well rounded. But, you know, I was like, I don't know. How to do that. Yeah. So but it was something that he had such an amazing lifestyle. He was able to be in his kids. They were young at the time. He was able to coach them T ball. He was able to, um, you know, drop them off at school and be at dinner every night. And that's something that I looked at and I saw my dad didn't have the ability to do, right? Like I didn't want to be a coach. I wasn't falling back into that, right? But that was something that stuck out to me as saying, like, wow, like you do really well. You're able to come and talk at business school classes, yep. like not just at a football team meeting, right? Like he was coming back to our huge business school class and talking about financial advising. And um, it, it was something that really piqued my interest. And I was like, okay, let me put that in my back pocket as a fallback. Um, but, but we'll, we'll see, we'll, you know, we'll see. And, you know, yeah. Know, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, that's, you know, that conversation back in 2017 uh, or 2018 uh, was, I think we both connected on that. Cause that was what I originally went to college, same concept you know i wanted to be a sports agent i've uh, you know i wasn't good enough to play in college i was a three sport athlete growing up um and uh but i was like yeah i want to be involved in some way shape or form and well, what's a great way i've watched jerry Maguire a thousand times too right i want to be jerry Maguire. like heck right. yeah who doesn't want to be right. him and uh <laughs> right. and yeah same thing i get to college and you know, go through business school, similar, you know, thought process. And, uh, you know, I, I, I sit down for the LSATs or I get, I, I schedule my LSATs and I just didn't want to study for it. And I was, and, and honestly, I just was like, you know what? I don't know if I actually want to do this. Um, uh, no yeah. And so, and, and, and so I, I, and I had three fraternity brothers that uh, we all, the four of us had talked about doing this. Two of them were older and one was younger. And so we were all like gung ho about it for years. And, you know, I just, I don't know what caused me to just not be as interested uh, in the law school piece of it, but it, it, it just, it happened. And so, you know, eventually, similarly, I, you know, had a few interactions, mainly my wife working at Raymond James that, showed me a different avenue potentially of, of working with athletes by instead of, you know, getting them to sign a contract and negotiating that and working with them from that perspective. But why don't I just manage the money that you get paid after that you sign that contract? Right, right. Um, <laughs> and, you know, right. funny thing is, I think we've talked about this recently uh, quite a bit. Like I don't think either one of us would choose to be in the other seat given what we know now and in, in talking to our friends <laughs> that are agents. I mean, it is, it's a very hard road and, and in some ways it's, it, it can be even harder than actually making it to the pros because it is a cutthroat, difficult business to be involved in. Um, that, yeah, quite frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I didn't go that route either. Uh, you, you know, absolutely. But we, we talked for, <laughs> it caused us to talk for probably like four hours or whatever it was that, that night, you know? And, uh, yeah. yeah. Cause it, I think a lot of people saw that movie of our age. Right. And we're like, Oh yeah, that, that's, yep. that's what I want to do. I want to be in sports. I maybe I'm not good enough to be a pro, but I can do this. Um, Right, but there's right. so many other ways to right. be and involved. So talk about so so right. we're getting to the place. Of, okay, you go to A and M, right, and yep. you yep. participate in their financial planning program, which is part of the reason that mm -hmm. we met, right? So talk about Absolutely. it was an idea of yours. Talk about as you started to get to know and learn more about it, why you decided okay, this is going to be where I'm going the route I'm going to go. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, quick. So when you stopped, when you when you stopped trying to go on a law, you went you went to the Bucks and worked there for a little. Yeah. Bit so after, when I was in right? yeah was when that? I was in business was school, uh, I I was okay. Uh, the marketing program had an internship re requirement. Okay, uh, that's right. And the Bucks mm -hmm. were were a participant in it, and so uh, right. so I interned 
uh, full time for them in spring of 2009. But prior to that, I did a training camp. Uh, I drove vans uh, in, uh, back when they were in Orlando <laughs> at Celebration. So I drove the players and coaches around That's in vans it. for a summer. Uh, then I was a full time intern the next spring and volunteered on game days in between. So the, the, the fall in between the two times and then the fall after that, I, I volunteered on game days as well. So, I, yeah, I thought my stopover was, uh, okay, well, even before I got to wealth management, I was like, well, I'm going to work in the NFL. I'll just work in the NFL. I'll work for a team, right? right? And I yep. graduate. then I graduated in 2009. Yep. No jobs. I was, I was yep. applying to <laughs> – I always tell the story. Like I applied to every minor league hockey team at every level all the way down <laughs> to the bottom that had a job listed on what – team works online is what it used to be called. Uh, yep. I mean, yep. literally every minor league hockey team down to the lowest level and could not get a job. It was completely <laughs> insane. So, it didn't work out. Um, and that caused me sort of some financial, personal financial issues, I guess you'd say, or, you know, adversity that ultimately was the driver for me to learn about personal finance. Because I didn't have... Nobody taught me that. Honestly, it wasn't something that my my parents had conversations with me about. Um, so, yeah, I was not getting the job in the NFL. Uh, the hardship that that created um, certainly led me to to here today. But I always had this just desire to, like your mom said, I, I, I wanted to be around football some way, shape, or form. And if I couldn't work for a team, yep. if I couldn't be a player, if I... If I just didn't want to do the, the law school agent stuff. Um, you know, I was always going to try to figure out a way to get back to it. Absolutely. And I think that's what, in that long conversation that we had at Bill's beautiful yeah. house and uh, <laughs> in the traditions and in, in college station, um, I think that's what kind of drew me to connecting with you is because we had the, sim- the same sort of pivot, right? Different circumstances, uh, different sort of um, outlook a little bit, but it was, you know, skeleton wise, it was very similar. Like you wanted to be a sports agent, realized you didn't. And then kind of in my mind, I saw it. I was like, oh, he he's the same, like he's the same way. He's yeah. the same way. He wants to be around sports. And so in my mind, it's like, that's why he went, you know, going with the Bucks. That's that's, you know, I had to make a similar pivot. Right. Is, you know, I, I finished my last year at Tulane and um, you know, I'm like, okay, well, I, I can't play here, um, you know, another year. So, you know, I was going to grad transfer and play a and my last year, right? Because, um, you know, something, you know, we'll talk about is, you know, the transition from being an athlete to that second career, right? That second stage in life um, that we talked to that, you know, we both talk with athletes about yeah. now, right? Is, you know, football has been a part of my life, my whole life, right? I've been playing since I was in second grade. So, to me, you know, you know, I, I joke in, in talking about Booby Miles and Friday Night Lights, and he's like, all I know, all I know to do is play football, yeah. right? But in a way, mm-hmm. like, it's such a part of our lives. That's that's not all we know how to do, but it, it's the main thing. And so I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to, like you said, be around the game. And so going to a and and, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work out. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, you know, see – try to be on the team or, you know, and see, and see how that goes. And then, you know, my dad's talking to these guys there and like, maybe you should get involved in like the athletic department side. And so I was like, I hadn't really thought about that, but like, I could see myself being an AD, like, because at the end of the day, right. What we want to help people. That's why, you know, we both do this, right. Is, you know, I want to be a sports agent because I want to help athletes. Right. Um, I want to be an an athletic director because I was like, I can't help student athletes before they even get to that point, right? And so, you know, I go and I meet with uh, Stephanie Rempe, who is the AD at uh, Nevada now. Uh, She just got got that job, so (laughs) got Stephanie. Um, And she really took it on herself and was like, okay, you know, Scott was a Baton Rouge guy, went to Catholic, and so we had that bond. And she was like, you know, I'm going to just start throwing stuff at you and you, you know, and if you can handle it, then you can handle it or whatever. But if not, then, you know, you know, we, we get an idea of whether you really like yeah. this or not very quickly. And she put a lot of uh, responsibility on mine and uh, Rebecca Parkhill, who's still at, at A&M 
uh, plate. And, you know, I think we handled it great. And I think through those experiences and, you know, it, you know, I learned like, wow, like I really do like, you know, what comes with this. The difference was, is that, you know, Stephanie and Scott were making what they made and I was a student worker and, you know, and not making that much. And I realized my next step was, you know, was not going to be making that much either. And, and, and around that same time, oddly enough, that's when I first yeah. met Bill, uh, who was our introduction. Uh, I met him at the the event that they have there where the you know the, the top donors pay and they come and go to practice and uh, get to sit in the meetings and be around the coaches and things like that during fall camp and you know my dad you know I had come to AM kind of initially wanted to get into business school or get be a be an MBA and you know I, I sat with you know the 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 board of the business school there and I was like I don't know if I want to do an MBA like I had to, you know it may not, I don't think it'll be really a fit. I think it's too kind of broad yeah. for what I want to do. And at that point, I knew part of what I wanted to do was help athletes with the financial element, even then when in talking to them. And that was something that impressed them at that point in time, right? And that I look back on, I'm like, wow, like I really was kind of headed this direction all along without even knowing, yeah. right? Um, and, and I met Bill and, you know, Bill being Bill is talking about his whole story of how he was a cow farmer and became a, you know, became into, into his great firm that yeah. he's at now, or he has now. And my dad was like, I got to get my son. So my dad calls me and I am, I, I can't remember where I was. I, I want to say I was working actually. And he's like, you got to get over here to, I think we were at RC Slocum's house and he, they were, they yeah. were at RC Slocum's house. And he's like, you got to get over here now. Like, this dude's doing, exa- he's doing exactly what you keep talking about and all of this, like, like come over here and meet. So I go and I talk with Bill the whole night, right, about, you know, the industry and he, him f- helped me found the financial planning college at, at, yep. at A&M and uh, he's like, we got to get you in. And I'm like, yeah, I had a great conversation. But at the same time, I was like, I'm just now starting this athletic department thing. And I don't, you know, I'm still not that much about finances. Like I'm not a, like I said, I'm not a finance bro. Like, I don't yeah. know, you know, I don't know what this profession really, you know, involves. And so I waited a year <laughs> and to, to, to give him a call back and say, Hey, I, at that point I realized I was like, okay, like as much as I love athletics, like I, I need to explore this financial yeah. planning thing. And so, um, you know, I, Thank goodness he still remembered who I was, <laughs> and uh, I I got back in touch with him, and he put me in touch with Doctor yep. Harness, who you know has was been tremendous for me uh, all on my journey, and uh, and, and I got in the program, and that was that was the biggest impetus of like okay, like I can kind of yeah. do this, like I you know at that point I was just in sports management, and I was like okay, like I know all this stuff, I yeah. lived a lot of this, right. But, you know, this, it was, it was challenging, but it was also like, okay, like I, I understand this enough. Um, and then when I met you, um, at Bill's house later on, I was kind of at a point of impasse where I I had decided to do this thing. And, you know, other than Dr. Harness and Bill, um, I had a lot of people, you know, mentors that, then honestly, I look back on it, it was helpful, but at the time it was scary yeah. because again, like I don't have this finance background. I don't know that I can do this. Like I hear Dickie's story about how he was a kinesiology major and he did it and all this stuff. And that's cool. But like, I don't know if I can. I always thought myself as, as talented and being able to, you know, like my mom said, grow where you're yeah. playing. Um, but I was like, I, I really, this is something I really don't know if I can do. And I think when I met you it was, you know, such a blessing because it was someone who had a very similar story, um, who was closer to my age, right? And who who like really understood, like who 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 saw something yeah. in me, right? Um, you know, and, and so that was, you know, having that, you know, I'm forever, you know, thankful for you, you know, for that. Um, but it was it was such a key time because I you know I had no idea where to go I was 
you know, interviewing for, you know, obviously wanted to be in New York and interviewing for jobs there and, um, you know, doing all these different things. And, you know, I just felt like I was kind of running around with the chicken with his head cut off and he kind of came in and we're like, no, let's, you know, let's, you know, let's do this and, and we'll see, we'll go from there and just kind of giving me that guidance and tutelage um, at, at, a, at a very key and crucial yeah. time um, in, in my grad school career. So, well, you, yeah, I mean, I, cause I think that's another thing that I saw. Well, to your point, you said this when we connected the thing that I think we connected most about besides wanting to be sports agents and this kind of similar journey was that, like you said, ultimately we both connected on the fact that we wanted to help athletes in ways that we didn't feel others were helping them. Whether it's the broke documentary that obviously any made sports, a major sports fan knows well, uh, which I think we talked about that night. You know, we just wanted to help them, truly help them, not try to make money off them, not try to you know, swindle them, none of that stuff. Like literally if we help, we felt like if we help them, their lives will be better by product. Our lives will be better. And we get to be involved in football in some way, shape or form. Right. Yep. And, and absolutely. part of what I saw in you was also what I knew besides the, t- the players who are actually in the league getting taken advantage of. Right. I'd also heard enough stories and known about enough guys who were former college stars or players even, and, or former pros who just didn't make it, who then try to go to this next career, which is, it's not as common as some of the other avenues athletes go, but you know, it's either insurance, it's wealth management, financial advising, or, you know, some sales type job, right. That, that you typically go, but I had seen enough who were in your shoes and would go out to be a financial advisor, quote unquote. I say that because some of the places they would go to, I wouldn't fully label them what you and I do today as wealth managers, really. Uh, and so I, I, I thought it was great that you were passionate and wanted to do that and go that route. But I knew the moment you put your name out there, the moment you put your resume out there and it's got all of the things on there. And if they look you up and see who you are, who your dad is, all those things start the vultures, I would call them swarming around you from the, the places that ultimately you could more likely end up one of those other stories than the success story. I think that, that you are today. And so, yeah, I, as, as much as, you know, I, connected with you on the mission. I also just didn't want to see you get gobbled up <laughs> by some, by some of those, those, uh, bad actors in my opinion. And, and, um, and, but at the same time, I think the nice part is you, you still had some of those conversations just to see it for yourself, right? You didn't, you did not go talk to some of those places that I told you, Hey, here's probably how this conversation might go. You still did it, which I think was important to, I hope give you like the the full picture of what was out there. One hundred percent, and you know I'm a I'm a big you know I'm you know I always hear the adage of like you know the country boy and me you know you're gonna learn that fat meat's greasy you, you you might learn that fat meat is greasy that was that's what you're talking about right is the you know you got to put you know I'm always okay I want to experience it a little bit but. And you say, I'm so thankful for you and, you know, Derek Strozer, Strozer, excuse me, and Kenny Welcome, who are both, you know, both of my former teammates who were, you know, they were, um, you know, seen older guys when I was at Tulane who got into the yep. industry and they had those experiences that we talked about. And, you know, I told you at the time, like, I don't want to be like, I don't want to end up having those experiences. Like they both, you know, I don't want to speak for them, but they both got in situations that weren't the best for, you know. Uh, the best for them, at least initially, right? And so you you hear you hear those stories, and, and you talk about you know, hey, like you know, one of, you know, you're gonna go to one of these major wirehouses and interview, and it's gonna go like this, and you know, you emphasized, I think, more than anyone else to me, how important my network was, and that at this point in my career, that's all I had, and so cherish it. And I think that in terms of that transition, transition, excuse me, into this second, this second career, this, um, this career that I'm in now, 
that was probably one of the biggest and most important advice, pieces of advice that I had that I really look back and say, I'm glad I took that part of what you said as literally as possible because, you know, I you told me, hey, when you go talk to them, they're, you know, it's going to be a conversation of who do you know, write down a list of all these people that you know, and then who they know and the industries they're in, and they're just going to have you call into your network and then when you do and when you're done and you know if you don't meet the requirements then you know bye bye and we're going to keep all these people yeah. by the way um and you know when you go talk to these people they're going to have you selling products all the time and then they're going to tell you about a management position all these different things right and so i knew i went and had the conversations because you know in my mind there are opportunities and i look at it in a way of like okay well if i know this i can go in and maybe like you know, I don't know. I, I'll at least experience it. Hey, I need, you know, I need the experience, right, of going in and interviewing and doing these interviews, yep. right? But B, if I know and I do happen to have to end up in these situations or I end up in a good situation, I can be on the lookout yep. for, for things like that. So I think that was, you know, one of the biggest things that even with, you know, getting involved with Raymond James, which, you know, is a company that, you know, that I got involved with through you and through Bill, um, it's a, a different yeah. feel um, from from a lot of those places, but also you know anywhere you know there's there's people that you know they again they see oh you know I, my whole life I've been here oh so I've been I haven't been Tristan Cooper I've been son of LSU football coach Ron Cooper Tristan right. Cooper you know like it's there's some some attachment there so you know I think. I always looked at it back then as like, oh, like I'm my own person or whatever. But then when you look at it, when you get into this field, then it's like, oh, you're okay. Like you got a lot of connections. Oh, your dad coached in Notre Dame. Oh, your dad coached. He was the head coach at Louisville. He coached with, you know, Steve Spurrier at South Carolina. He coached with Les Miles. He was at Nick Saban at Alabama. Like then it it starts to like pile on and and, and their eyes get big. Right. And then it, it starts to become, okay, well, how can, I get this guy to, you know, not only do work for me, but also like bring his network with me. Right. And so I was very conscious of who I work yep. with. Um, and that, you know, fortunately led me into a great team now and, 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 and having a great working relationship, you know, with from the management team here and all the way through to the team that I, that I currently work on. But I could have very easily been one of those stories like you said, where I get gobbled up just because of who I know and, and and connections and things like that, that you, you know, that you never want to be on, on, on that side yeah. of. So it's not very fun. No, it, it's not. I think, you know, one of the, the other things I want you to talk about is like the job you ended up taking, right? Number one, you were months without a job, like months, right? Was it like 10 months or something like yep. that? It was, geez, it was, I think it was about six okay, or seven so months, qu- six or seven months. Without and and, and yeah. it, it yeah, started so to come down to the wire, right? Because you had an offer and you're like, I don't know if I'm going to get another one. So I might need to take this one that you didn't feel 100% confident about, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, so I interviewed uh, at a place and I, I won't say the name, but the, a bull is their logo. <laughs> um, and... They offer me, you know, their run of the mill, you know, fi- you know, financial advising role, entry level financial advising role, um, paid me a good salary. Uh, it was in New York, which is where I wanted to be. And, you know, that yeah, offered it to me really quick. You know, I feel like I did a good job in the interview, um, uh, you know, and I was it, it just something was off about the office, right? There's good people that I that I met with, but there was just something about, you know, it was cold and and after going through a lot of interviews at other places, it's similar, right? And um I was kind of at an impasse because, you know, you had connected me with the people at Raymond James and, you know, they were like they called they got reached back to me around the same time and were like, "Hey, we're coming up with this new program. I think we, and to kind of rewind, I think what we both decided that I felt like I needed was something that would allow me to come into the industry and give me a ground floor view, right? And allow me to 
learn everything, learn as much as I can, um, drink through that proverbial fire, yep. hose, you know, and, and trying to retain as much information as I can, because I don't have, again, I keep going back. So I didn't have this heavy yep. finance background. So I, I needed to learn, but I also would benefit, not that I, I love pressure as an athlete and I love competing and things like that, but something that would give me the ability to preserve my network. That was the most important thing. And so I think we decided that, you know, if you can get in a position that allows you to do that, that would be best, yeah. right? And so I got offered this job and I was like, man, like, this is good money. This is where I want to be, um, you know, get started going. And then Raymond James reaches out and they're like, hey, we're starting this new program. It's not going to be ready until, you know, January to the new year. You know, maybe that's our hope. And it's never you be a part of the first yeah. class. So no idea how it's going to go. Right. And, you know, by the way, we're not guaranteeing you this job, even though like, you know, we're you know, you have a strong chance because you have good recommendations from you know yourself and Bill. But, you know, we're not guaranteeing you this job. So you're going to have to come in and interview and compete for it. And so. I was like, I was at it. I was like, I got a, you know, a bird in the hand is better than two in yeah. the bush. And so I'm sitting here and I'm like, all right, I'm, you know, I thankful for uh, my parents who let me stay with them <laughs> for this time and not, not, you know, and letting me figure all of these things out. But, you know, I was fortunate to have that to where I could be like, okay, well, I'm going to wait. I, I just, I don't feel so strongly about this. It was all the things that we talked about. I'm going to keep looking because I don't want to be stagnant yep. and because I don't know if I'll get this. And I didn't get it. That was the funny thing is I didn't get it. It was down to me and uh, someone who I'm good friends with now who uh, is no longer in the industry, but yeah. I didn't get it, you know? And so <laughs> after all of that, um, and, and so that was, that was tough. It was so tough because I, it was, you know, I was in limbo for such a long time, like you said, but, you know, it, it, it definitely worked out. I ended up in Boston, um, you know, Steve Pryor, who is the man, who is the uh, director of our, our, our Northeast region here with Boston and Portland, Maine. Um, I, I don't think I could be in a better situation than, than to have, you know, fell in, fell in his, I mean, the first conversation we had, and I told you, it was similar to nope. ours in that. It's almost like we knew each other for 30 years and I'm not 30 yeah. years old. So, you know, that was that was one of those types of situations. And uh, to have an advocate, you know, who who understands the uh, understands me as a person and, and understands the things that I'm going to go through and is really going to vouch for me to be successful was 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 such a blessing. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's what, you know. I think the lessons from your that part of your story for any athlete, whether you're coming out of pro football or you're coming out of college or any sport, whether it's football or not, right, is ultimately making sure that whoever you are going to work with has your best interests in mind. Whether that's hiring a financial advisor, that's hiring your agent, or that's finding your next job. That's what we often talked about in that moment, right? Is yeah, I remember you telling me that, that conversation you had with him was just like, this is the right guy for me to work with. And the job was, yeah, it wasn't even what you thought you were going to get because you didn't get the one. They didn't really have a seat per se at the time when you first got in there. And you were kind of just doing like whatever. I mean, paperwork, like basic. <laughs> admin level things i think that's the other lesson is not only find the right person but regardless of your background regardless of your network sometimes you have to come in literally at the base level and learn the foundational uh, items you need to learn so that you can build my good friend always talks about building a skyscraper raising a child is like building a skyscraper Right. If you screw up the base of the skyscraper, the whole thing's going to topple over. You can make a minor mistake at the top, right? Mm -hmm. And the whole thing isn't going to fall over. And that's sort of what, what we were talking about is make sure that the base is right. The people you work with and the knowledge that you gain 
before you go tap into the top of the skyscraper, which is this amazing network of people you've built over your life, whether through your dad or through yourself or through the people that you know, uh, you know, before you tap that and before you build the top, make sure that you have that base and that the people that are helping you build the base are the right people to have around you. I think that's a story for, Absolutely. for any student athlete for sure. But, uh, you know, in our arena, any football player, you know, if you're coming out of the pros, you know, make sure you're surrounding your pe- yourself with the right people and that you might need to be willing to do the base level work of whatever field you, you decide you want to get into. Brandon Marshall, again, I keep going back to him because I just, I think I give him a lot of credit for how much he puts out there about the things he's overcome yep. and the faults he's had and the mistakes he's made. But I mean, when he talked about, I am athlete, you know, he got into at the ground floor, like, you know, the production of it, you know, building the studio, recording, editing, all of it. I mean, he was literally in the weeds of it all. And that made him, I think, better at being on the screen and, and, and doing the actual podcast. And, and I think that's a great lesson. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, to your point, um, I think that that's, that's so important is to, is to have, like you said, that, that foundation uh, to build upon. I think that that was, you know, so, like I said, so important for me, so important for me. But I think the other thing that I learned too, to go with that is, is to not be stagnant, right? Like use the analogy of like, you know, a shark dies when it stops swimming. You got to keep moving forward and swimming, right? And so I think I got to a point where in that, within that program, you know, I was like, and, and it was a conversation that we had too, was like, Hey, I don't know. Like, uh, you know, it started out great, and then obviously COVID happened, which threw a you know, um, just a small, you know, <laughs> small wrench in everybody's lives. Just a little one. Um, but I was like, man, I don't really think that I'm getting the most out of the program and out of myself within the program, right? And so. You know, therein lies another pivot, right? And so I think to your point in, you know, building this proverbial skyscraper that is, you know, you know, your wealth management business or your your career after football, I think is important to have this great foundation. The number one thing I think that I mean we can both agree on is is having having the right people and having yep. good people around you. You can never have enough Dustins and Bill Carters and you know, Dr. Harnesses and all these people that this are going to give you great advice along the way to help you grow and, and, and succeed um, and, and, and want you to be successful, most importantly. But I think that constantly evaluating where you are, and I think that's something that I learned, you know, throughout my athletic journey is, you know, how can I get better? Like, you know, I go back to high school, right? And, you know, it's my junior year and we're getting ready for to play you know, our quarterfinal playoff game and, I, you know, I've just been killing it all year, receiver, I feel like, and it, but like, I just, you know, I want to take it to another level and coach Chad Mahaffey, our, our head coach, he's, he's got these legendary Jerry Rice uh, uh, practice films from when he was with the 49ers, right? And I'm like, coach like I really want to like change some things or whatever and he just I'm, I'm talking he's a very he's a man of few words very quiet whatever and he comes with, comes with me son <laughs> and I go very 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 Yoda like into his to his office and he hands me this this DVD back in the day when we yeah. had those um <laughs> and and he and it's you know I don't know what it is he's like go home and watch this and whatever and I go home, it's Jerry Rice and my favorite receiver, uh, favorite player of all time, right? And I'm watching and watching. I'm just breaking down and that whole practice, that the whole week of practice. I'm just dialed in at, at how to be Jerry Rice. Like, I, I, I wanted all of my routes to look like Jerry Rice. I wanted all my yep. cuts to – and, you know, I end up having a great – so it's, you know – when you, I say all that to say, when you get to this point where you're like, all right, like I am, I'm here, like I got in a good situation, you still can't be stagnant. You have to keep pushing and keep 
evaluating where you are and where you want to, where you want to go and how we're going to get there and, and, and keep pushing and saying, am I putting myself in a position to get there? So that's equally as important as, you know, getting that good base knowledge in my opinion or, or base foundation um, from a learning, learning experience. Uh, yes. Yeah. So. I mean, you know, use a football term, right? You always got to keep your head on the swivel, right? Because either that's somebody's going to try it. to hit you or you need to hit someone. Right. Or there's a ball in the air you need to catch. You're not sure if it's coming to you or one of the three other guys on the field that's running routes, but you need to be ready at all times and be, be able to adjust as things happen in life. Right. And, and that's, I think for, for people who are in the spotlight for in whichever way that is in sports, you have to be even more aware because there's the life pivots that you need to make that all people need to make, but there are people who are intentionally changing the route in a direction that benefits them and not you. And so you also have to be aware of those instances. And and I think that's, what's great about what we do today in wealth management and, and working with players with their money is a lot of those, you know, bad routes come up related to money. So I, I feel like what's, I can make a huge impact on a player's life now because I can help them stay off of those paths because almost all of them have something to do with money. You know, somebody's like, you know, what do you, what do, what do you do for a player today? Well, I, and, and I say I'm more of a life coach today than just a wealth manager, but wealth management is the base of it because most decisions in life somehow involve money at this stage of where they are. Right. And, that's why I love what we do is because I can truly help them stay on the right paths and make the right decisions uh, and stay off of the bad paths uh, as much as I possibly can. But keep them aware as their coach that your head needs to be on a swivel. Like I can't be there for you all times. You have to understand certain things and learn certain things so that when you're out there and somebody comes up to you and pitches you this or wants you to do that, that you can make the no decision, you know? Uh, yep. and so that's why I love what we do. And, and, and I'm passionate about working with this subset of, uh, of people who just have unique lives from all areas you can, you can think of, uh, but unique opportunities, uh, and unfortunately are, are often underserved. So, um, so I think it's great to hear no, your absolutely. journey and people like, yourself because quite frankly there's more Tristans right than there are Patrick Petersons of the world right there, there just quite frankly are and and there's I am yep. athlete telling the Patrick Peterson Aaron Donald Michael Strahan stories and hopefully you know we can tell more of these types of stories of the rest of the football players and student athletes but let alone all the other student athletes are out there of what you still are a value. Uh, you have a lot of value when you come out of that background and make sure you maximize it and you don't get taken advantage of. And, and hopefully telling your story and, and is, is helpful for others. Absolutely. And you know, I think to your point of being a coach, right? I think my favorite thing that you know, I have a few coaches and, and players and things like that now as clients and um, my favorite thing that people that they say or people will say is, you know, you don't want to be a coach like your dad. You don't want to be a coach like your dad. And I'm like, well, I am a coach, right? Like I'm a, it's just different yeah. type of coach, uh, to your point. And so there's always a, like, like you said, there's always a pivot, uh, from what you do. All that hard work that you have, um, doesn't have to go to waste. You can utilize your experiences as a player, uh, as a coach. Um, you know, whatever level, you know, as a student athlete to springboard you into your next career, into that next phase in your life. And it's important, you know, from a mental health standpoint and from a personal and professional standpoint to know that, you know, how you can be very successful at some, at at this or at at some other thing, uh, whatever it may be, utilizing the thing you know, what you built your life around. Uh, and I, I can't emphasize that point enough because I've been there. I've been at that point where, 
you know, I'm like, this is my life's work. Like I've been playing sports my whole life. What, you know, whether it was, you know, baseball and track and basketball and soccer, you know, whatever it was, you know, going through middle school and high school, you know, this is, this has been my life. Like, this is all I know. Uh, what, you know, really like what, is that all for waste? Was that right. all for not all those years? And it doesn't have to be. And so that I think it's just so important for the people to know that that doesn't it doesn't make you a failure because you didn't achieve, you know, the necessary goals that you set out to achieve initially. But it, it's just a, like I said, it's just a springboard to propel you to that next great thing that you're going to do. Because, you know, like you said, not everybody can be Patrick Pierce and not everybody can be old right. Rebecca. There's only one Odell. There's only one Patrick Pearson. There's only one Honey Badger, right? But you can be the best, you know, Dustin or the best Tristan or the best whoever you can be in this next career and help those guys when they get to the point where, hey, they can't play anymore or, you know, guys who may not, you know, may not be Odell international, you know, superstar, right? Like, and so they've got to figure out that next move, whether it be broadcasting, whether it be being a high school coach, whether it be being a teacher, right? Like whether it be being a coach, right? And so being able to help and assist them again at the end of the day, we do this to yep. help people. And I, you know, what what better way to help people than, than what we do? And uh, I think we're both passionate passionate about it, and you know, happy to share my story and, and, you know, aid in whatever way I can to, to other strengths. Yeah. So. And uh, we could talk for hours about like the, the rest <laughs> of what we do and, and how it impacts, uh, you know, people's lives. Um, but I think it's, it's good to probably stop there and, and appreciate you taking the time and kind of going through your journey and telling your story. And, uh, hopefully a lot of people find value of it and, and, Hopefully we'll have more of these conversations and maybe we'll talk about the other part and some of the things uh, from the money standpoint uh, that players should pay attention to. But yeah, this is all about helping people. That's what we're here for today for. That's what we do for our careers. So I appreciate you taking the time and, and, and trying to help as many people as you can. No, absolutely. More than happy to. And like I said, just happy to be able to give back to someone who's given so much to me and poured so much into me. So happy to do my little appreciate part. it man well it's, it's been great and being a mentor is as great as being a mentee at times i've learned just as much i think from our conversations as, as you have from me so so it's been great